Welcome to the second and final part of my response to Stephen Crowder. In part one, I responded to Crowder's comments regarding the Vatican, China, Pope Francis, and numerous other things, but I skipped over his remarks where he talked about the Catholic Church during World War II because it is best to make a separate video on it. Let's hear what Crowder said. You may not know this, all references available at uh, lightofcrowder.com, World War II. Vatican, by the way, they're higher, they, they had a, an aggressively neutral, let me put it that way, stance towards the Nazis. And uh, uh, you had uh, Pope Pius, so what was his number? Pope Pius was it? Twelve. Was it twelfth? I believe it was the twelfth. Yeah. I don't know. So many so numbers. So many of them, yes. He was notoriously silent, obviously, during the Holocaust. According to one Nazi ambassador, over 1,000 Jews were rounded up and taken away under the Pope's very windows. Let's start by actually looking at the sole source Crowder provided in his show notes. The very source he cites doesn't actually agree with Crowder's position on this topic as a whole. Crowder will go on to say that the Vatican is actually pro-Nazism, but even this poorly informed source he quoted doesn't take this position. The article literally says that the certain conclusions remain to be seen. The article cites three points in order to make Pope Pius XII appear bad. The first is a quote by a historian complaining that the Pope was effectively silent, which, as we will see later on, is a laughable claim. The second point is that a 1963 German play depicts Pope Pius badly, but this was literally a fictional play and widely condemned at the time. And as we will see, it was actually Soviet propaganda in the war between communism and the Catholic Church. The third point is that John Cornwell wrote a book claiming that the Pope was pro-Nazism. John Cornwell made so many historical blunders in that book that he had to retract numerous things in the following years. He explicitly backtracked his comments that Pope Pius' motives was evil. The source Crowder cited appears to be completely ignorant of this fact. Historian and rabbi David Dahlen wrote, The mainstream media happily endorsed his unverified and strongly anti-religious conclusions. Author Eugene Fisher, who holds a doctorate in Hebrew culture and education, lamented, It is a sad commentary on the secular media that this blatantly anti-Catholic screed was ever published much less hyped into a bestseller status. Ken Woodward wrote, Most of his sources are secondary and written by Pacelli's harshest critics. Errors of fact and ignorance of context appear on almost every page. Cornwell questions Pacelli's every motive, but never tells those who tell a different story. This is bogus scholarship filled with non-existent secrets aimed to shock. Stephen Crowder also completely ignored what the same source he quoted says. Jewish historians like Sir Martin Gilbert have shown that the Pope rescued 5,000 Jews in Rome by sheltering them in convents and monasteries, with hundreds even being placed in the Pope's very own summer residence, and even in the Vatican itself. So to summarize the sole source Stephen Crowder cited, it's a secondary source which doesn't even agree with Crowder's position. And the article makes extremely basic errors like citing laughable opinions, fictional plays, and discredited individuals who themselves backtracked a lot of their points. And Crowder completely ignores what established historians like Martin Gilbert have said, which paints a positive picture of Pope Pius and the Vatican during World War II. Crowder ignoring this makes me question whether he even read the entire article I suspect he just read the article title and the opening two paragraphs. Crowder's main point so far is that Pope Pius XII was aggressively neutral and notoriously silent, with the only source he cites being absolutely bogus, and just a few minutes of research into each of the points raised in the article and fact-checking them would lead you to the opposite conclusion of Stephen Crowder's narrative and agreeing with distinguished historians like Martin Gilbert. We're going to look at the actual primary sources soon, but first let me sketch you an outline. We have many newspaper articles from major Western and Jewish publications from the 1930s to 1950s, referring to Pope Pius XII and praising him. 
with not a single one being negative. The only negative articles about Pope Pius XII during this time are from the Nazis, because the Nazis hated Pope Pius XII and called the Pope a mouthpiece of the Jews. It's laughable to think that the Pope was silent when the Nazis themselves believed that he was explicitly condemning Nazism and the persecution of Jews. Contemporary Jews themselves highly praised Pope Pius's efforts to combat Nazism and saving Jews, including numerous chief rabbis. I guess revisionists from generations after know much more about Pope Pius than the entire contemporary world from all sides. I guess the entire known world covered up for Pope Pius XII, and instead of having every reason to expose him, they praised him instead. And countless people were completely deceptive in attributing to him good works, even people he had direct contact with. And we all know about them sort of transporting uh, some of the Nazis out. This is a lie. The claim that the Vatican of Pope Pius transported Nazis out of Germany to places like Latin America, for example, is a complete fabrication. It's true that someone like Bishop Udall was guilty of this, but consider the following quote by Matteo Sanfilippo. On 6 December 1949, the German agency Nordpriest announced that Bishop Aloy Hudal was a well-known pro-Nazi prelate in Rome and that he received from 60 to 100 Germans daily who were looking for tickets and visas to Latin America. Exactly one week later, the Sunday edition of the Passauer Nieuwe Press reported on two networks of spies smuggling Nazi criminals to Argentina and to the Middle East. The first had been centered in Rome, but its headquarters were shut down because of Vatican pressure. Udall was a small fish who tried to look bigger, smarter and more powerful than he really was. And that was also the opinion of Jesuit historian Robert A. Graham, who later co-authored with David Alvarez, Nothing Sacred. Nazi espionage against the Vatican 1939 to 1945. That book revealed that during the war, Hudal was an informant for German intelligence, but nobody listened to him in the Vatican, and least of all in Berlin. Individual bad clergymen or lay people can be found in every group. Any group that is big enough will have bad apples. For example, there are some individual conservative and Democrat voters who are racist. Does that mean that Steven Crowder is also a racist? Does that mean that the whole Republican Party are racist? That the Republican Party encourages racism and is guilty due to a few bad apples? Of course not. Me smearing the image of the Republican or Democratic Party because there are some racist members in your respective voter bases or even in the official party themselves does not mean that the actual party is automatically guilty as a whole. So if you find one or two bad Catholics who did bad things, who had no influence at the Vatican and the Vatican was consistently against Nazism and did not condone such bad behavior, trying to smear the Catholic Church and the Vatican is an absolute embarrassing attempt in trying to present yourself as a logical person when the same illogical, slanderous and scandalous argument can be used to condemn literally anything and everyone. And by the way, Dr. Joseph Lichten, a Polish Jew, wrote that the Vatican actually assisted Jews and other refugees to flee Italy. So the Vatican helped Jews escape, not Nazis. I, I, look, I understand that there's a gray area where some Nazis were forced to be Nazis, but if you actually look at the reading that came, uh, the writing that came from the Vatican, that's not all they were doing. So Crowder says that some Nazis were forced to do some things where they didn't really want to do something. But this isn't the case when you look at the writings from the Vatican, insinuating that the Vatican was actively pro-Nazism and not forced. So Crowder doesn't show any quote from the Vatican in order to prove they were truly pro-Nazism and there is nothing in the article he linked. I can't even recall revisionist historians try to make such a laughable claim that they are actually writing from the Vatican that are pro-Nazi. But we have abundant evidence that Crowder is not telling the truth. Take a look at what Pope Pius XI, for example, said in 1938, as written by Rechleck in his book Hitler, the War and the Pope. The accompanying anti-Semitic laws led to an open personal feud between Mussolini and Pope Pius XI, 
which continued until the latter step. The day after Mussolini announced the new policy, Pius XI used uncompromising terms of condemnation, calling it nothing but apostasy and the spirit of racist doctrine contrary to the faith of Christ. It is forgotten today that mankind is only one large, all-inclusive general race, said the Pope. In September, he stated, Mark well that in the Catholic Mass, Abraham is our patriarch and forefather. Antisemitism is incompatible with the lofty thought which that fact expresses. It is a movement with which we Christians can have nothing to do. No, no, I say to you, it is impossible for a Christian to take part in anti-Semitism. It is inadmissible. Through Christ and in Christ, we are all the spiritual progeny of Abraham. Spiritually, we are all Semites. Well, there goes the claim that the Vatican was aggressively neutral. And if you read what came out of the Vatican, you will see that they were actively pro-Nazism by choice. Well, that was Pope Pius XI. What about Pope Pius XII? Consider what Rabbi David G. Dahlen wrote. In January 1940, for instance, the Pope issues instructions for Vatican Radio to reveal the dreadful cruelties on uncivilized tyranny the Nazis were inflicting on Jewish and Catholic Poles. Reporting the broadcast the following week, the Jewish advocates of Boston praised it for what it was, an outspoken denunciation of German atrocities in Nazi Poland, declaring they affronted the moral conscience of mankind. The New York Times editorialized, now the Vatican has spoken with authority that cannot be questioned and has confirmed the worst intimations of terror which have come out of the Polish darkness. In England, the Manchester Guardian hailed Vatican Radio as tortured Poland's most powerful advocate. Even before the war started, Pope Pius XII, also known as Pacelli before he became Pope, consistently condemned Nazism. Rabbi David G. Dahlen continues, It was while Pacelli was his predecessor's chief advisor that Pius XI made a famous statement to a group of Belgian pilgrims in 1938 that anti-Semitism is inadmissible. Spiritually, we are all Semites. And it was Pacelli who drafted Pius XI's encyclical with Brennan de Sorge with burning concern, a condemnation of Germany among the harshest ever issued by the Holy See. Indeed, throughout the 1930s, Pacelli was widely lampooned in the Nazi press as Pius XI's Jew-loving cardinal. Because of the more than 55 protests, he sent the Germans as the Vatican Secretary of State. Of the 44 speeches Pacelli gave in Germany as papal nuncio between 1917 and 1929, 40 denounced some aspect of the emerging Nazi ideology. In March 1935, he wrote an open letter to the Bishop of Cologne, calling the Nazis false prophets with the pride of Lucifer. That same year, he assailed ideologies possessed by the superstition of race and blood to an enormous crowd at pilgrims at Lourdes. At Notre Dame in Paris two years later, he named Germany that noble and powerful nation whom bad shepherds would lead astray into an ideology of race. The Nazis were diabolical, he told friends privately. Hitler is completely obsessed, he said to his long-term secretary sister Pascalina. All that is not of use to him, he destroys. This man is capable of trampling on corpses. Meeting in 1935 with the heroic anti-Nazi Jutrip von Hildebrandt declared, There can be no possible reconciliation between Christianity and Nazi racism. They were like fire and water. Rechleck wrote in Hitler, the War and the Pope, the following. One effort Pius did make in 1943 was to have his nuncio in Berlin, Cesare Orsonigo, approach Hitler directly in order to discuss the treatment of Jews in Germany and in occupied areas. Orsonigo reported, A few days ago I was finally able to go to Berchtesgaden, where I was perceived by Hitler. As soon as I touched upon the Jewish question, our discussion lost all sense of serenity. Hitler turned his back on me, went to the window and started to drum on the glass with his fingers, while I continued to spell out our complaints. All of a sudden, Hitler turned around, grabbed a glass off a nearby table and hurled it to the floor 
with an angry gesture. Faced with this kind of diplomatic behavior, I thought my mission was over. Consider the following contemporary newspaper text during the Second World War. In 1939, the New York Times headline reads, Dictators, treaty breaking and racism are condemned by the Pope in his first encyclical. Joseph Fichten reports that it read, The first of these pernicious errors today so widespread is the disregard for that law of human solidarity and charity dictated and imposed by the common origin and equality in the rational nature of all men, regardless of the people to which they belong. In 1941, in the editorial, the Pope's message reads, The voice of Pius XII is a lonely voice in the silence and darkness enveloping Europe this Christmas. The Pope reiterates what he has said before, in calling for a real new order based on liberty, justice and love to be attained only by a return to social and international principles capable of creating a barrier against the abuse of liberty and the abuse of power. The Pope put himself squarely against Hitlerism, recognizing that there is no road open to agreement between belligerents whose reciprocal war aims and programs seem to be irreconcilable. He left no doubt that the Nazi aims are also irreconcilable with his own conception of a Christian peace. Rabbi Dahlen continues, In March 1940, Pius granted an audience to Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, and the only high-ranking Nazi to bother visiting the Vatican. The Germans' understanding of Pius' position, at least, was clear. Ribbentrop chastised the Pope for siding with the Allies, whereupon Pius began reading from a long list of German atrocities. In the burning words he spoke to Ribbentrop, the New York Times reported on March 14th, Pius came to the defense of Jews in Germany and Poland. The Pope's Christmas message the following year, in which he expressed his concern for those hundreds of thousands who, without any fault of their own, sometimes only by reason of their nationality or race, are marked down for death or progressive extinction, was widely understood to be a public condemnation of the Nazi extermination of Jews. Indeed, the Germans themselves saw it as much. His speech is one long attack on everything we stand for, he is clearly speaking on behalf of the Jews. He is virtually accusing the German people of injustice towards the Jews and makes himself the mouthpiece of Jewish war criminals. An internal Nazi analysis reads, Pius XII was ready to let himself be deported to a concentration camp rather than do anything against his conscience. Mussolini's foreign minister railed. Hitler spoke openly of entering the Vatican to pack up that whole whoring rabble, and Pius knew of various Nazi plans to kidnap him. So the question is, why do people accuse Pope Pius XII of being silent? As we've already seen, he certainly wasn't. The accusation bases the game on the fact that the Pope didn't verbally condemn many high-profile incidents publicly, even though he condemned Nazism and the Holocaust numerous times. So why didn't the Pope verbally condemn every single event perpetrated by the Nazis? Rabbi Dahlen explains, Holocaust survivors such as Marcus Melchior, the chief rabbi of Denmark, argued that if the Pope had spoken out, Hitler would have massacred more than 6 million Jews and perhaps 10 times 10 million Catholics if he had the power to do so. Robert M. W. Kempner called upon his experience at the Nuremberg trial to say, Every propaganda move of the Catholic Church against Hitler's Reich would have been not only provoking suicide, but would have hastened the execution of still more Jews and priests. This is hardly a speculative concern. A Dutch bishop's pastoral letter condemning the unmerciful and unjust treatment meted out to Jews was read in Holland's Catholic churches in 1942. The well-intentioned letter which declared that it was inspired by Pius XII, backfired. As Pinchus Lapid notes, the saddest and most thought-provoking conclusion is that whilst the Catholic clergy in Holland protested more loudly, expressly, and frequently against Jewish persecutions than the religious hierarchy of any other Nazi-occupied country, 
more Jews, some 110,000, or 79% of the total, were deported from Holland to death camps. Bishop Jean Bernard of Luxembourg, an inmate of Dachau from 1941 to 1942, notified the Vatican that whenever protests were made, treatment of prisoners worsened immediately. So clearly, Pope Pius XII was smart and prudent. As we've already seen, Pope Pius XII was regularly condemning Nazism and the Holocaust. He didn't go overboard and condemn every single event publicly because he must have discerned that it would have done more harm than good in those instances. Consider what Ronald J. Rechleck wrote. Zuccotti's argument that Pius XII was not supportive of rescue work is based upon the lack of an existing written order from the Pope. She writes that if there were a papal order to help Jews, it would almost certainly have been preserved by someone clever enough to understand that it might someday help the Pope's reputation. In making this argument, she severely underestimates the danger of life in a Nazi-controlled nation. It was extremely dangerous to keep papers related to anti-Nazi efforts, and few who worked in the underground did. For instance, in the spring of 1940, there was an attempt to oust Hitler by a group of German generals who wanted to surrender to the English. The negotiation took place with the Vatican's mediation and the direct cooperation of Pius XII. He went so far as to inform the Allies about German troop movements. However, there are no documents on this in the Vatican's published collection. The documents were found only in the British archives. Vatican papers were undoubtedly destroyed. Anyone who cared for the Pope would have destroyed written instructions for him. More important, no one at the time thought Pius XII's reputation would need to be protected. As rescuer John Patrick Carroll Abing wrote in his 1965 book, Never in those tragic days would I have foreseen, even in my wildest imaginings, that the man who, more than any other, had tried to alleviate human suffering, had spent himself day by day in his unceasing effort for peace, would twenty years later be made a scapegoat for men trying to free themselves from their own responsibilities and from the collective guilt that obviously weighs so heavily upon them. Rechleck also reported on pages 301 to 302 that Sister Pascalina, a domestic worker of Pope Pius XII, witnessed the Pope burning letters he wrote due to the fear that it could fall into the wrong hands. Lapid also reports that the Jewish couple from Berlin, the Wolfsons, were held in concentration camps but escaped and was hidden in a convent thanks to the Pope, waiting to be transported to Spain in order to escape. After the war, they wrote, None of us wanted the Pope to take an open stand. We were all fugitives, and fugitives do not wish to be pointed at. The Gestapo would have become more excited and would have intensified the Inquisitions. If the Pope had protested, Rome would have become the center of attention. It was better that the Pope said nothing. We all shared this opinion at the time, and this is still our conviction today. Does that mean that the Pope always made the right decision? and never made a mistake in specific circumstances? No. Realistically speaking, we will always make a decision in our lives where we look back and we are like, why did I choose that? I should have taken the other option. It would have been better in this instance if I decided differently. I missed a great opportunity where I made the wrong judgment call. Things like this. Can any one of us honestly say that we can even imagine the difficulty of decisions the Pope must have made and discerned acting in such an extreme environment of stress and violence, where one wrong move can be potentially catastrophic and cause the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Even the most well-intentioned individuals can make a judgment call that ends up being the wrong decisions. But overall, I applaud Pope Pius XII for the immense goodness he brought to the 20th century, and I base my applause on actual historical facts. Well, they, and so in this story, the under the walls, that under the windows, that actually comes from when they were rounding up Jews, they fled to the Vatican for protection. Oh, that was a mistake. And were basically pinned up against the walls and taken. Basically, they, were, they had nowhere to go. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why he says we, we rounded them up and take, took them away under the Pope's very windows. They were watching us do this. They See, I thought moved. it was figurative windows. Nope. 
This was literally what happened. Oh, boy. Now, maybe the Pope Not allegorical. On the other side of the compound, and he couldn't technically, it couldn't have been the Pope's window. They knew what was going on. Yeah. And they didn't take a stand. Sacrado and Gerald is discussing the arrest of Jews on the 16th of October, 1943. Gerald says that it took place literally under the windows of the Vatican, that people were pinned against the walls, and that the Jews fled to the Vatican for protection. I'm not aware that any of these Jews fled to the Vatican on that day. I haven't been able to find a source for that, but if they did, it shows that they knew that the Catholic Church was known among the Jewish people as a place that offers them protection. I haven't heard about any accounts of Jews being pinned up against the walls of the Vatican, because the article they cited, as well as other articles online, says that the Jews were rounded up numerous blocks away from the Vatican, almost a kilometer. So I'm not sure where Gerald is getting that from. I don't know if there was maybe one or two Jews that ran towards the Vatican because they knew the church helped other Jews already, or if Gerald just heard someone who distorted the account's details and just messed it up and then accepted it as a fact. Nevertheless, the entire area outside of the Vatican walls were Nazi-occupied area, so it's not relevant where the arrest took place. Consider the full quote that can be found in Rechlag's Hitler, the War, and the Pope. The next day, Weissacker wired to Berlin that the Curia is particularly shocked that the action took place, so to speak, under the Pope's windows. Similar wording can also be found in the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann's diary when discussing the letter they received. The church was vigorously protesting the arrest of Jews of Italian citizenship requesting that such actions be interrupted immediately throughout Rome and its surroundings. To the contrary, the Pope would denounce it publicly. The Curia was especially angry because these incidents were taking place practically under Vatican windows. But precisely at that time, without paying any attention to the Church's position, the Italian fascist government passed a law ordering the deportation of all Italian Jews to concentration camps. The objections given and the excessive delay in the steps necessary to complete the implementation of the operation resulted in a great part of the Italian Jews being able to hide and escape capture. Eichmann is essentially paraphrasing what Weissacker wired to Berlin. The Curia is particularly shocked that the action took place, so to speak, under the Pope's windows, while Eichmann's paraphrased the Curia being angry because the incident took place practically under the Vatican windows. So the terms used, so to speak, and practically means that it is not literal. It's similar to the expression we use when we say something happened right under our noses. Notice that the Nazi war criminal literally says that the Catholic Church vigorously protested the arrest of the Jews and demanded it to stop, and that they were shocked and angry and that such objections caused an excessive delay, which helped many Jews hide and escape. Furthermore, regarding the Roman Jews, keep the following facts in mind. While approximately 80% of European Jews perished during World War II, 80% of Italian Jews were saved. In the months Rome was under German occupation, Pius XII instructed Italy's clergy to save lives by all means. Beginning in October 1943, Pius asked churches and convents throughout Italy to shelter Jews. As a result, many Italian Catholics defied the German orders. In Rome, 155 convents and monasteries sheltered some 5,000 Jews. At least 3,000 found refuge at the Pope's summer residence at Castel Candolfo. 60 Jews lived for nine months at the Gregorian University and many were sheltered in the cellar of the Pontifical Biblical Institute. Hundreds found sanctuary within the Vatican itself. Following Pius' instructions, individual Italian priests, monks, nuns, cardinals, and bishops were instrumental in preserving thousands of Jewish lives. Similarly, Dr. Joseph Fichten wrote, the Pope sent out the order that religious buildings were to give refuge to Jews even at the price of a great personal sacrifice on the part of the occupants. He released monasteries and convents from the cloister, law forbidding entry into these religious houses to all but the few specified outsiders, so that they could be used as hiding places. 
thousands of Jews, the figures run from 4,000 to 7,000, were hidden, fed, clothed, and bedded in 180 known places of refuge in Vatican City, churches and basilicas, church administrative buildings, and parish houses. Unknown number of Jews were sheltered in Castel Gandolfo, the site of the Pope's summer residence, private homes, hospitals, and nursing institutions, and the Pope took personal responsibility for the care of the children of Jews deported from Italy. The Pope's bedroom in Castel Gandolfo was even converted into a maternity ward for the pregnant Jewish woman. This all required the direct intervention of the Pope, as he was hiding Jews in the Vatican itself and even in his own summer home. Sir Martin Gilbert, a Jewish historian, wrote, in an attempt to forestall the deportation, the Vatican clergy opened the sanctuaries of Vatican City to all non-Aryans in need of refuge. Catholic clergymen throughout Rome acted with alacrity. By the morning of October 16, a total of 4,238 Jews had been given sanctuary in many monasteries and convents in Rome. A further 477 Jews had been given shelter in the Vatican and its enclaves. As a result of the Church's rapid rescue efforts, only 1,000, fewer than one-fifth of Rome's 5,700 Jews were seized that morning. Notice that Pope Pius saved roughly 5,000 Jews from Rome. Today, people complain about the 1,000 he was sadly unable to save, while completely ignoring the 5,000 he did. Cardinal Pietro Palatini stressed that the merit is entirely Pius XII, who ordered us to do whatever we could to save Jews from persecution. Some of the laity helped as well, and in their testimony afterwards, consistently attributed their inspiration to the Pope. The most eloquent testimony is the Nazis' own. Fascist documents published in 1998 speak of a German plant dubbed Rabat Fon to be executed in January 1944. The plan called for the 8th decision of the SS cavalry, disguised as Italians, to seize St. Peter's and massacre Pius XII with the entire Vatican, and specifically names the papal protest in favor of the Jews as the cause. In 1943, James Weissman, who would become Israel's first president, wrote that the Holy See is lending its powerful help wherever it can to mitigate the fate of my persecuted co-religionists. Moshe Saret, Israel's second Prime Minister, met with Pius in the closing days of the war and told him that my first duty was to thank him and through him the Catholic Church on behalf of the Jewish public for all they had done in various countries to rescue Jews. Rabbi Isaac Herzog, Chief Rabbi of Israel, sent a message in February 1944 declaring the people of Israel will never forget what His Holiness and His illustrious delegates inspired by the eternal principles of religion, which form the very foundation of true civilization, are doing for our unfortunate brothers and sisters in the most tragic hour of our history, which is living proof of divine providence in this world. In September 1945, Leon Kubowski, Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, personally thanked the Pope for his interventions and the World Jewish Congress donated $20,000 to Vatican Charities in recognition of the work of the Holy See in rescuing Jews from fascist and Nazi persecutions. Rabbi Eugenio Zoli, also known as Israel Zoller, the chief rabbi of Rome during World War II, wrote in his 1954 memoir, the Vatican had already spent millions in aiding fugitive Jews to reach safety. He also wrote, the Holy Father sent by hand a letter to the bishops instructing them to lift the enclosure from convents and monasteries so that they could become refuges for the Jews. I know of one convent where the sisters slept in the basement, giving up their beds to Jewish refugees. No hero in all of history was more militant, more fought against, none more heroic than Pius XII. He also said, what the Vatican did will be indelibly and eternally engraved in our hearts. Priests and even high prelates did things that will forever be an honor to Catholicism. Further, Zoli also said, 
the Vatican has always helped the Jews, and the Jews are very grateful for the charitable work of the Vatican, all done without distinction of race. The Pope and the Vatican were infatigable in working to save Jews, and many hundreds were sheltered in monasteries and convents in Rome and in Vatican City. Elia Tuaf, an Italian Jew who lived through the Holocaust and later became the chief rabbi of Rome, said, More than all others, we have had the opportunity of experiencing the great compassion and goodness and magnanimity of the Pope during the unhappy years of the persecutions and terror when it seemed that for us there were no longer an escape. Dr. Joseph Lichten, a Polish Jew who served as a diplomat and later an official of the Jewish Anti-Defamation League of Benai Berif, writes, Bocelli had obviously established his position clearly, for the fascist governments of both Italy and Germany spoke out vigorously against the possibility of his election to succeed Pius XI in March of 1939. The day after his election, the Berlin Morgan Post said, the election of Cardinal Pacelli is not accepted with favor in Germany because he was always opposed to Nazism and practically determined the policies of the Vatican under his predecessor. Dr. Naim Goldman, president of the World Jewish Congress, wrote in his letter of condolence on Pope Pius's death with special gratitude, we remember all he has done for the persecuted Jews during one of the darkest periods of their entire history. Lichten also spoke about the public statements of the Pope after Germany took over Italy and began arresting Jews. The Pope spoke out strongly in their defense, with the first mass arrest of Jews in 1943, and the Osservatore Romano carried an article protesting the internment of Jews and the confiscation of their property. The fascist press came to call the Vatican paper a mouthpiece of the Jews. Joseph Lichten also quotes a letter by Rabbi Safran of Bucharest sent towards the papal nuncio paying tribute to the Pope on the 7th of April 1944. It is not easy for us to find the right words to express the warmth and consolation we experience because of the concern of the Supreme Pontiff, who offered a large sum to relieve the sufferings of the poor the Jews. The Jews of Romania will never forget these facts of historic importance. Joseph Lichten also mentions the tributes to Pope Pius XII by Israel's Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1958, Golda Meir, as well as the chief rabbis of Egypt, London, and France. Finches Lapid estimated the total number of Jews saved as a result of Pope Pius XII's efforts in three popes and the Jews. The final number of Jewish lives in whose rescue the Catholic Church had been the instrument is thus at least 700,000 souls but in all probability it is much closer to 860,000. 700,000 to 860,000 Jews would translate roughly into 4 million alive today, meaning around 25 of the Jewish population alive today exists due to the actions of Pope Pius XII and the Catholic Church. Sir Martin Gilbert, the renowned Jewish historian, said, to assert Pius XII was silent about the Nazi mass murder, is a serious error of historical fact. Asked if he agreed with the Vatican's 1998 declaration on the Holocaust that hundreds of thousands of Jews were rescued under Pius XII, Gilbert, who spent decades meticulously researching the Holocaust in archives around the world, told me that the statement was not a self-serving exaggeration, but historically accurate. Yes, that is certainly correct. Hundreds of thousands of Jews saved by the entire Catholic Church, under the leadership and with the support of Pope Pius XII, would to my mind be absolutely correct. After hearing all of these testimonies and historical facts, the only way for someone like Crowder to continue holding to the opinion that the Vatican and the Pope did nothing during World War II is to completely close their eyes to the data and pretend it doesn't exist. The Vatican was aggressively neutral the only aggressive thing here is your ignorance. Now it is time for my favorite part of this entire video. Bear with me, trust me, you're gonna laugh at the irony. What is the origin of this false narrative against Pope Pius XII? 
I introduce you to General Egon Mihai Facheva. He was the head of the Romanian intelligence service. He was at the top of the Soviet bloc intelligence community. He defected to the United States in 1978, and he says that the 1963 play The Deputy was used by Soviet intelligence in order to rewrite the image of Pope Pius. He wrote, the changing of Pius XII's past was a long, drawn-out framing operation that began in 1945 and had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Stalin wanted to defeat the Ukrainian Catholic Church and, as a result, framed prominent Ukrainian Catholic bishops and roughly 500 priests. Pius XII answered by issuing an encyclical to the faithful in Ukraine, assuring them that God will do justice and that in his loving kindness he will himself calm this terrible storm and finally bring it to an end. Stalin took Pius XII's encyclical as a declaration of war, and he answered as was his wont, framing Pius XII as a Nazi collaborator. On June 3, 1945, Radio Moscow proclaimed that the leader of the Catholic Church, Pope Pius XII, had been Hitler's Pope. Radio Moscow's insinuation fell flat as a pancake. Just the day before, on June 2, 1945, in an address to the Sacred College of Cardinals that was broadcast on Vatican Radio, Pius XII condemned the satanic specter of Nazism. President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill and Albert Einstein also praised Pope Pius XII for his efforts in fighting Nazism. The Kremlin's attempt to frame Pius XII as Hitler's Pope was rejected by that contemporary generation that had lived through the real history and knew who Pope Pius XII really was. The Kremlin tried again in the 1960s with the next generation, which had not lived through that history and did not know better. This time, it worked. Regarding the deputy play, the author of it, Rolf Hukuf, says Pasepa, had multiple plays where he smeared anti-communist. Rolf even made use of David Irving in some of his other plays. Irving speaks positively about Hitler and is a Holocaust denier and an anti-Semite. In other words, Rolf writes fictional plays and his research is made out of tinfoil. Pacepa reports that the producer of the deputy play, Urban Biscater, was a member of the German Communist Party and later a member of the NKVD, which was roughly a Soviet secret police organization and that in the postscript to a 1934 edition of a play he produced, Piscator wrote that his theater was always political, that is to say, political in the sense approved by the Communist Party. The Berlin premiere of The Deputy was produced by an openly communist theater headed in by Piscator. It was quickly translated and produced by some of the most prominent names in theater. All were Western communists or sympathizers. The first French version was translated by Jorge Simprum, a member of the French Communist Party and later of the exiled Communist Party of Spain. The British version of the deputy was produced by Peter Brook, who during World War II produced a play with the proceeds going to the Aid to Russia Fund. In 1955, he made a successful tour of the Soviet Union. Later, when Brook put together an anti-Vietnam play, US, the Lord Chamberlain complained that it was bestial, anti-American and communist. The American publisher was Grove Press in New York, which belonged to Barney Rosé, a self-proclaimed communist. Grove Press also published Che Guevara's diaries with an introduction by Fidel Castro. In a 2006 interview, Rosé was asked about his religion. He replied that he had never had a religion, so I became a communist as a religion. The producer of the deputy on Broadway was Hermann Schumann, an active communist. According to Time magazine, Schumann was the only American producer who advertised in a communist daily worker. The article went on to note that Mr. Schumann had almost no friends except leftist Helen Hellman. Hellman, with whom Schumann had a professional and romantic relationship, was outspoken in her support for communism. The first review of the deputy was published in 1963 by I.F. Stone an American journalistic icon, who later was proved to be a Soviet intelligence agent. Recently published KJB documents in the Vasiliev archive 
show that I.F. Stone had been recruited by the NKVD in 1936 on ideological grounds and given the code name BLIN. Venona intercepts of highly classified Soviet intelligence and suffered communications from 1944 show that by then Stone was a paid NKVD influence agent. A following review of the deputy, also published during 1963, was signed by another American journalist paid by the KJB, Victor Perillo. Also during 1963, as the deputy was beginning to create a rift between Catholics and Jews, a KJB-sponsored publisher in the U.S., the Liberty Prometheus Book Club, republished an old pro-communist book that mirrored the charges raised by the deputy. The book was Shylock, the History of a Character, authored by Hermann Schinsheimer, and it focused on the mistreatment of Jews by popes and other Christians. Liberty Prometheus Book Club was co-owned by Carl Aldo Marzani, an Italian-born American communist and very active Soviet disinformation agent. Documents in the Mitrukin archive show that Marzani received substantial sums of money from the KJB for having his Liberty Book Club publishing company produced pro-Soviet material. Marzani was also given an annual $10,000 from the KJB to advertise those books aggressively. When the deputy was about to open in Broadway, many prominent individuals protested it. Rampart's magazine from San Francisco took the lead in defending it. It took far more money than a magazine like Rampart's would reasonably be able to devote to such a project, but it was successful. CIA documents released under the Freedom of Information Act confirmed that by 1966, Rampart was a reliable outlet for Soviet propaganda. It is not hard to speculate but where Rampart got its funding to promote the deputy. In other words, the deputy was published and reviewed and pushed heavily by communists, with many of them with direct ties to the Soviet Union, with the KJB operational patterns all pointing towards the, the campaign against Pope Pius as being Soviet propaganda, according to this former Romanian intelligence officer, who was at the top of the intelligence community of the Soviet bloc. The primate of Hungary, Josef Kardel Menzenti, was also framed by the KJB in order to portray him as a Nazi. Hanna Sulner, a Hungarian handwriting expert, admits to having fabricated the evidence against the cardinal. To avoid a similar public embarrassment, the KJP authorized General Pacepa to set a plan in motion to get documents from the Vatican archives in order for them to claim that they have authentic documents from the Vatican, even though the documents contained nothing incriminating. In 1963, General Ivan Agayant, the famous chief of the KJP's disinformation department, landed in Bucharest to thank us for our help. He told us that seat 12 had materialized into a powerful play attacking Pope Pius XII, entitled The Deputy. A guidance took credit for the outline of the play, and he told us it added voluminous appendices of background documents put together by his experts, with help from the documents we had purloined from the Vatican. A guidance also told us that the deputy's producer, Ivan Perskater, was a devoted communist who had a long-standing relationship with Moscow. I had reason to believe a guy in self-serving claim. He was a living legend in the field of disinformatia. General Pasepa recounts numerous accounts of how a guy had managed to deceive President Roosevelt and even the entire world, including prominent British historian Edward Hallett Carr. Today, many people who have never even heard of the deputy are sincerely convinced that Pius XII was a cold and evil man who hated the Jews and helped Hitler do away with them. As KJP chairman Yuri Andropov, the unparalleled master of Soviet deception, used to tell me, people are more ready to believe smut than holiness. Toward the mid-1970s, the deputy started running out of steam. In 1974, Andropov conceded to us that, had we known what we know today, we would never have gone after Pope Pius XII. What now made the difference was newly released information showing that Hitler, far from being friendly with Pius XII, had in fact been plotting against him. Just a few days before Andropov's admission, the former Supreme Commander of the German SS Squadron, 
in Italy during World War II, General Friedrich Otto Wolf had been released from jail and confessed that in 1943 Hitler had ordered him to abduct Pope Pius XII from the Vatican. In his confession, Wolf claimed that he had replied to Hitler that his order would take six weeks to carry out. Hitler, who blamed the Pope for the overthrow of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, wanted it done immediately. Eventually, Wolf persuaded Hitler that there would be a great negative response if the plan were implemented and the fear were dropped it. It was also during 1974 that Cardinal Menzenti published his book Memoirs, which described in agonizing detail how he was framed in communist Hungary. So to summarize, it is abundantly clear that communist propaganda was behind the deputy play and that the communists had a pattern of attacking the Catholic Church and its members. Okay, so what is so ironic about all of this? The ironic thing here is the fact that Steven Crowder called the Vatican a communist crap hole. When Crowder is the one believing in Soviet propaganda and pushing it. And uh, you know what, they probably uh, maybe helped out a little bit in the Holocaust. After hearing this remark from Crowder, I believe that it is abundantly clear to anyone watching now how uneducated, uninformed, poorly researched and illogical this statement from Crowder really is. To hold to Stephen Crowder's position, you would have to believe and claim that all the Jewish, Catholic, Allied and Nazi authorities, leaders and press were all mistaken about Pope Pius. With many of them lying, and despite having no evidence whatsoever, Pope Pius was the complete opposite of what everyone thought and said and knew he was at the time. That Pius himself wrote and said both publicly and privately the exact opposite of what he really thought. That Pope Pius secretly impeded Nazi plans, was involved in and assisted in the plot to assassinate Hitler and saving the most Jews during World War II compared to anyone else hid and protect the Jews from the Nazis despite hating Jews and being on the Nazis' side and that the Nazis hated Pope Pius and planned to kidnap him and kill him despite him being aggressively neutral or an ally that the unanimous opinion of the entire world was wrong and or deceptive and everyone covered it up and praised Pope Pius at the time when most people had no reason to do so and had every reason to expose him. I guess the Nazis planned to kidnap the Pope, kill him, consistently condemn Pope Pius as a Jew-loving cardinal and a mouthpiece of the Jews and as an enemy to Nazism without realizing that the Pope was actually helping them? Meanwhile, contemporary Jews praised Pope Pius, including numerous chief rabbis and major Jewish organizations, publications and historians. I guess no one told the countless Jews hiding in the Vatican and in the Pope's summer residence that the person that is actively saving them is actually killing them? I guess testimonies from people saying that Pope Pius instructed them to save Jews all must have misheard what the Pope instructed them. I guess Pope Pius must have forgotten that he was a Nazi when he repeatedly condemned Nazism. If anyone wants to believe in the sinful research and logic and act like a Gnostic pretending to have secret knowledge of what's really going on, even when it contradicts all of the historical facts and logic, then I can't stop you. But please don't present your narrative as being faithful to actual historical research. Just imagine how horrified the chief rabbi of Israel, Isaac Herzog, would be if he knew what Stephen Crowder believes today. The people of Israel will never forget what His Holiness did. Sadly, many people in today's world have forgotten. As the Jewish Holocaust expert, Holocaust survivor, scholar and journalist Juno Levi said, It's a particularly regrettable irony that the only man in all occupied Europe that did anything to alleviate the suffering is today made the scapegoat for the failures of all the others. Thank you for watching until the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a lot of new things. So I hope you can see now also the danger of misinformation. It took Stephen Crowder like two minutes to say the garbage he did and then it took me more than 10 times that amount 
to actually address that. So that's a problem. It takes much longer to clean up a mess than it takes to make a mess. But luckily it did lead to the good of this video for people to learn the truth. So that's one good thing that came out of it. So I hope this has been a blessing and thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. So I finished my recording and then I realized I forgot to frank my... Frank? I don't even have a frank in my life. Wow. Anyways, I forgot to thank my friend Isaac for his great research on this topic and helping me. And also a huge credit to all of the other great historians also that have done a great job in preserving the truth. And lastly, I would just like to add, I'm only defending Pope Pius XII because it's the truth. Like, if, if you could somehow substantiate the claim that Pope Pius XII was bad, I have no problem accepting it. Because there's been many, 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 many great saintly popes. And there's also been a couple of really bad popes in history. Like, I have no problem accepting that. Popes can be amazing, great, good, above average, average, below average, bad, very bad. I've got no problem accepting that. It's part of the historical record of the church. But I only care about the truth, and that is why I want to defend Pope Pius XII, because the historical evidence shows that he did an amazing job.